Good day students and welcome to theme 3, Project Quality Assurance. So we've now done general um, quality management as applicable to projects. We've also done quality planning. So now the next step is to do Project Quality Assurance. Um, theme 4 is Project Quality Control. And it's important that you understand the difference between project quality control and project quality assurance. So just remember that assurance is about the processes. So it's making sure that we're following the processes correctly, whereas control is about the product. So it's about measuring the product at the end of the day and making it sure that it actually meets the requirements of the client. Okay, now this, oh, there we go. Right, so the outcomes of this theme is to define project quality assurance and its benefits, list, list the inputs, tools, and techniques, and outputs of project quality assurance, describe the seven quality management and control tools, discuss quality audits, and discuss process analysis. So again, you will see that this is quite a theoretical theme. Remember that quality is quite theoretical. So here are the resources. Okay, so we are now on the purple block over here, quality, a uh, project quality assurance. Okay, so perform quality assurance is the process of auditing the quality requirements and the results from quality control measurements to ensure that appropriate quality standards and operational definitions are used. The key benefit of this process is that it facilitates the improvement of quality processes. Okay, so again, the work performance is measured using the quality control me um, measurements, and that happens during quality control. And then at the end of the day, quality assurance is about the improvement of quality processes. So here we have the inputs, the tools and techniques, and the outputs for perform quality assurance. So we have the quality management plan, which we generated during quality planning. We have a process improvement plan, which was also generated during quality planning. We have the quality metrics, which are included in the quality plan. So this is how are we going to measure um, uh, quality. We have the quality control measurements. So although we only do the quality control uh, theme after the quality assurance theme, the quality control is actually an input to quality assurance and then product project documents. So under tools and techniques, there's the quality management and control tools, there's quality audits, and there's process analysis. Now, for the, the purposes of this course, I am only expecting you to understand um, and be able to uh, describe the tools and techniques. Um, there are some slides that try to make the tools and techniques a little bit more practical and when you do your assignments um, on the KYP project you are welcome to use those tools and techniques and if you do use those tools and techniques you will get extra marks. Um, all right but but um, in in the exam and in the test the only way that I'm going to ask you questions is basically describe discuss so there will not be no application. Okay, and then the outputs of the quality assurance um, process is change requests, project management plan updates, project document updates, and organizational process assets updates. Right, so here you can see perform quality assurance um, is sitting here in the middle, and plan quality management and quality control are inputs to this process and <clears throat> outputs of it are develop project management plan because we update the project management plan depending on what we find in uh, perform quality assurance 
There can be some integrated change control that happens and your organizational process assets are updated. So your organizational process assets are basically the way that the organization does things. So it's the processes, it's the culture, it's the procedures, it's the standards. And you can see that as part of perform quality assurance, we might decide to that it is necessary to update some organization-wide um, quality standards. All right, so here are the seven quality management and control tools that we will discuss. But once again, please note, you only need to know the definition of these, um, but you are more than welcome to use them in your um, assignment. And if you do, you will get extra marks. Now, some of them, like, for example, tree diagrams and network diagrams, we have already done in detail in this course. So let's look at them. Okay, so affinity diagrams um, are similar to mind mapping techniques. They are used to generate ideas that can be linked to form organized patterns of thought about a problem. So if I have a problem, and I want to find out what is causing what and what is the process. And um, there, there's like a lot of ideas going on in my head. I can dump that and then I can try and draw an affinity diagram where I show how these ideas are linked. So the creation of the work breakdown structure may be enhanced by using affinity diagrams to give structure to the decomposition of scope. Because remember in the work breakdown structure, as um, we <clears throat> spoke about it and as I taught you in the first semester, um, it is just a tree diagram and there is no uh, interrelationship between the different elements on um, the work breakdown structure, except that whatever is at the bottom has to make up the top. That's the only um, relationship. But sometimes you might have um, a relationship between different elements in the work breakdown structure that you want to indicate. All right, so here is a affinity diagram. Um, this is a matrix type one. You, if you Google and you uh, look on on the internet, you will find that there are various structures that you can use for an in, uh, for an affinity diagram. So um, here you can see the solution to maintaining a successful process. They've got customer requirements, provide training, communication, controls, and management. And then they have all the items that have to be taken into account for each of these um, breakdowns. Okay, and then if you want to use affinity diagrams, especially in your project, here um, are some uh, online sources that explain um, affinity diagrams in more detail and explain exactly how to use affinity diagrams. The other thing is you might want to use affinity diagrams in your work situation. Um, so here is um, further information on, on how to use them. But you will not be examined on that in this course. And then there's also a free online tool uh, for drawing affinity diagrams. Okay, so the next tool is the process decision um, program chart. It's used to understand a goal in relation to the steps for getting to the goal. So basically, you have the goal and then you have the steps to get to the goal. The PDPC is useful as a method for contingency planning because it aids teams in anticipating intermediate steps that could derail achievement of the goal. So when we talk about risk management, um, which is the last theme of this uh, module, uh, you will see that we talk about contingency planning. So at that stage, I want you to think back about the process decision program charts um, because they are ways that you can also use to do contingency planning. Okay, so here is a <clears throat> chronic illness management uh, program. So there's patient self-management support, decision support, information systems, uh, delivery system redesign. And each of these are then uh, broken down further 
Um, and at the bottom, you will then see nurse guidance and approval, checklist of possible goals, buddy or sponsor, achievement and maintenance rewards, financial penalties, replace resistant staff, involve staff, enroll definitions, visit clinic with CIMP in place. And this is because at the level um, above that, you can see that we have identified some problems that, that could happen. And so at the bottom, we have now come up with some solutions that we can use to um, stop these problems that can happen at this level over here. Right, and once again, um, here are some online tools that you can use that will tell you more about how to set up Russian process decision program charts. Okay, so interrelationship interrelation, diagraphs. Try and say that one first. Okay, an adaptation of relationship diagrams. It provides a process for creative problem solving in moderately complex scenarios that possess intertwined logical relationships for up to 50 relevant items. So the moment you go over 50 relevant items, it becomes much too complex. So the interrelationship diagram may be developed from data generated in other tools such as affinity diagrams, tree diagrams, and fishbone diagrams. So basically you take all the information that you've generated with these three and you then try and draw one picture of what the whole system looks like. So here um, you can see issues around a computer replacement projects um, and here is the interrelationship um, diagram that shows you how all of these things are related to each other. And for more information on how to set them up and how to use them, you can go to these online sources. And some of them really explain very nicely um, how to set one up and what it's used for and how you can use it in, in the real world. Okay, so tree diagrams, also known as systematic diagrams, may be used to, de to represent decomposition. Now, we've already learned about tree diagrams because um, we've looked at work breakdown structures and we've also looked at organizational breakdown structures. Now, another tree diagram that we also sometimes use in um, project management is the risk breakdown structure, um, but we're not going to do that uh, when we do risk management later on uh, because we basically just touch on risk management, um, so we don't have time to go into a lot of detail. So it's useful for visualizing the parent to child relationship in any decomposition hierarchy that uses a systematic set of rules that define a nesting relationship. So if you remember when we did work breakdown structures, we said that the parent at the top is made up of the children at the bottom and we had certain conventions and rules for how we have to draw the lines. Because if we didn't draw the lines properly, we did not show that relationship properly. So tree diagrams can be depicted horizontally, such as a risk breakdown structure, or vertically, such as a team hierarchy or organizational breakdown structure. So here is a tree diagram of the project resources. There's materials, people, and equipment. Um, people uh, has further been broken down into project management, marketing, purchasing, technical, and construction. And then the technical, you can see, has been broken down further with mechanical engineering being broken down um, all the way. Right, so that just gives us an indication on our project of um, what the resources are that we require. And so as with any tree diagram, um, it's difficult to put all the information on one page. So we will obviously have another page where the materials again are highlighted or the equipment is highlighted. Oh, sorry, now I went too fast. Okay, so how to use tree diagrams. Again, here are three online sources um, that you can look at that will give you more information.
Right, so prior to prioritization matrices, they identify the key issues and the suitable alternatives to be prioritized as a set of decisions for implementation. Criteria are prioritized and weighted before being applied to all available alternatives to obtain a mathematical score that ranks the options. Okay, so um, typically in project selection, one would use a prioritization matrix. So you would decide um, how do we as an organization want to select the projects that we do. So maybe first one of them would be to um, to identify uh, or, or rather to, to, to decide okay that profit is is the most important or is one of the um, is one of the things that we look at. Uh, and, and another thing is building future business and maybe um, another thing is development of our resources. And we then um, apply weights to it and we say that for the project, or if the project makes profit, that counts 50%. If the project um, grows our business, that counts 30%. And if the project um, develops our resources, that counts 20%. Okay, so that's our weighting. Um, that, that's the, sorry, that's the prioritization and weighting of our criteria. So now we will take, say, our 10 projects and we will analyze them and we will see how much profit they make, for example. And we will see how much do they... Um, contribute to growing our business and how much do they contribute to um, uh, developing our resources and we will then give each project a score and this score will then be put through the weights of 50 and 30 and 20 percent that we decided on um, in order to get a mathematical score which then ranks the options for us okay so um Activity network diagrams, these were previously known as arrow diagrams and they include activity on arrow, activity on node, and they are used with project scheduling methodologies such as PERT, critical path method, and precedence diagramming method. Now, in essence, the activity on node, the PERT, the CPM, and the PDM are all pretty much the same type of thing. Um, so... Here is an activity on arrow diagram, um, an activity on node diagram, which is what we did uh, during the uh, first semester, a PERT diagram, a CPM, a critical path method, and a precedence diagramming method. Now, um, I've given some internet sources for all of these, uh, but at the end of the day, you know how to work out a critical path, and that's all you need to know. All right, then matrix diagrams are used to perform data analysis within the organizational structure created in the matrix. The matrix diagram seeks to show the strength of relationships between factors, causes, and objectives that exist between the rows and columns that form the matrix. Okay, so let's look at a matrix diagram. So what we have here is we have three plants, okay, and they... Um, uh, produce food, medical devices, and general um, things. And we have our suppliers on this side, and we have our products on this side. And then with our blocks, we then indicate whether the um, technical requirements are high or whether the technical requirements are normal. So you can see that for the general, um, or that the general um, things uh, are applicable to product one and product three. And um, you can see that they are made uh, for supplier C. So you can see matrix diagrams can be used to show interrelationships between more than one variable. And here is 
uh, internet source that you can use to find out more about matrix diagrams. All right, so quality audits. A quality audit is a structured, independent process to determine if project activities comply with organizational and project policies, processes, and procedures. So um, in PJPB, we do uh, project audits, but a project audit is wider than a quality audit because a quality audit is just um, interested in the quality side of the project, whereas a project audit goes wider um, because it is interested in the entire process and procedure that is being followed on the project. Okay, so the objectives of the quality audit is to identify all good and best practices being implemented, identify all non-conformities, gaps and shortcomings, Share good practices introduced or implemented in similar projects in the organization or industry. So you can see that there is um, a level of benchmarking um, that happens there. Proactively offer assistance in a positive manner to improve implementation of processes to help the team raise productivity and highlight contributions of each audit in the lessons learned repository of the organization. Yeah, so this is basically what a good or what a quality audit is about. So the results of a quality audit are hopefully to reduce um, cost of quality, to increase sponsor and customer acceptance of the project's product. Because if you are following a good process, we hope that that means that um, we are delivering a good product. Quality audits can confirm the implementation of approved change requests, including updates, corrective actions, defect repairs, and preventive actions. Okay, and then the last thing that we want to discuss is process analysis. So, um, if you remember, we have done one um, tool where we can that we can use to document the process that we use on a project. And that tool was the um, flowchart. So process analysis follows the steps outlined in the process improvement plan to identify needed improvements. It also examines problems experienced, constraints experienced, and non-value added activities identified during process operation. So you obviously start with a process flowchart and then you decide whether there can be improvements in the process. Process analysis includes root cause analysis. And remember the Ishikawa diagram is one of the ways that we can do root cause analysis. A specific technique used to identify a problem, discover the underlying causes that lead to it and develop preventive actions. So in essence, process analysis is what you are doing on your KYP project because you are looking at what the current process um, looks like. You are gathering some data on um, the, the causes of problems, etc., etc. And at the end of the day, you're going to come up with a modified flowchart to show how the process can be improved. Okay, so that is the end of um, project quality assurance. So again, this is theoretical stuff. You need to know the definitions. Um, if you go to the internet sources that I gave you on how to apply it and you use it in your projects, you will get extra marks. Thank you and goodbye.